Good morning. My name is Michelle Carr and I'm an educator at the North Carolina Museum of History here in Raleigh. And I'd like to welcome everyone, all of you from around the globe. I know we have some participants from England and I'm sure some other countries are being represented as well as the great North State. But I'd like to welcome you all to our textile preservation workshop led by our own Paige Myers. Today's program is being offered in conjunction with our special exhibit, Dressing the Abbey, which features 35 costumes from the popular series, Downton Abbey. The exhibit is slated to close this Monday, January 17th. If you want to visit the exhibit or perhaps even see it again, you can purchase tickets at the museum in person or online at ncmuseumofhistory.org. Click on exhibits and just follow the links to be able to get ticket information. I also want to mention that the very last Dressing the Abbey program will take place tomorrow, Sunday, January 16th at 3 p.m. when Susanna Buxton, the Emmy award-winning costume designer for the first two seasons of Downton Abbey, joins us to discuss her creative process. Along with working on Downton Abbey, Susanna has worked on many other films and popular television shows, including Bulldark. I'm looking forward to hearing all about her work on Downton and her other series, particularly working with period costume. There's still time to register for this free event. It's gonna be a virtual program. Susanna's coming to us from Spain, originally from London, but uh, Family Matters have taken her on the road as well. So if you'd like to register for this program, just go to the museum website, go to, down to events, and you can find the information on registration. But today we're here to gather some tips for the proper ways to clean, store, and display our family's textiles, or as I like to call them, our treasures. And we're going to get those tips from Paige Myers, the textile conservator here at the North Carolina Museum of History. I'm gonna take a moment to apologize. I have a special guest. One of my pets has joined us this morning, Raleigh, and he's feeling quite vocal. So if you hear him in the background, I do apologize, but I'm gonna to try to keep him as quiet as possible. He's generally pretty good. So if you hear that sound, that, that's what it is. Sometimes he pops up on the screen, but I'll, I'll keep him his uh, interruptions to a minimum, I promise. All right, I'd like to introduce Paige to you all. She's eminently qualified to lead this workshop. She has been a conservator for over 25 years, having performed contract work for the Smithsonian Institution, National Museum of American History. She's worked with as a private conservator in the Washington DC area and has completed internships at the American Textile History Museum in Lowell, Massachusetts, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, and the Biltmore Estate here in Asheville, North Carolina. She has a postgraduate degree in textile conservation from the University of Alberta, Canada, a Bachelor of Science degree in clothing and textiles from East Carolina University, and an associate's degree in liberal arts from Shuan University. Paige has been a member of the Costume Society of America since 1991 and is a member of the American Institute for Conservation and a member of the Southeastern Regional Conservation Association. From 2016 to 2019, she served as a board member of the North Carolina Preservation Consortium. Following her preservation, sorry, her presentation this morning, Paige will have time to answer some of your questions. If you do have questions for Paige, you can send them to us using the chat function should be at the bottom of your screen. If you'll send those to us, then we'll monitor through them and we'll share them with Paige at the end of the program. I'd also like to mention that Paige has very generously developed two handouts based on today's program. And we have everyone's registration list. We'll be sending those handouts to you via email next week. So now it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Paige Myers. Good morning, Paige. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I wish I had a kitty in my lap, but uh, I'm coming to you from the museum today. Uh, and I just wanted to give you some of the, uh, the top tips that I have of caring for your collections. Uh, so let me see if I can get this technology going. Uh, my area of expertise is needle and thread, not, uh, let's see, share screen. Sorry, let's see if I can get this. All right, here we go. <laughs> so uh, my topic is keeping the past alive. And this is how to care for your own heirloom textiles. Um, we all have something that we care for uh, that has been passed down from generation to generation. 
And sometimes people really don't know what to do with it. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about today, sort of the basics of how to care for your heirlooms. Um, first of all, what is conservation? I get that all the time. So you're a conservator, what does that mean? Um, there is a long definition that you can see there and it's uh, encompassing actions to take towards the long-term preservation of cultural property, um, which means heirlooms, et cetera. But the long and the short of it is that textile conservators seek to find out what an object is, first identify what it is, what's wrong with it, and how am I going to fix it? Uh, that's just the simple definition of it. Um, that's the easiest way to explain conservation to people. Uh, now, people also call me uh, a restorer as well, too. Now, I know that some of you are, are uh, joining us from overseas, and the term conservator and restorer can be used interchangeably. Uh, here on this side of the pond, though, um, restorers usually refer to someone who's actually taking something back to the original. Uh, a lot of people think of restoring old antique cars, uh, restoring dolls, things like that. In conservation, we want to stabilize the object as it is uh, and uh, retain that integrity of the object while not repainting something, uh, you know, or, or reweaving something, though there are times that we do have to do that. So conservation and restoration are uh, sort of side-by-side -side types of treatments. Um, one can be used interchangeably, but think more of restoration as a more invasive type of treatment. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today are just some basics, um, the basics of handling textiles, uh, common things that you'll see uh, when uh, you're looking at your heirlooms of what kind of damage is there, uh, help, where do I find help, uh, simple things that you can do at home, and also just a little bit about how to store and display my heirloom. And I have some resources as well. Uh, and as uh, Michelle mentioned, the handouts will be available as well after the uh, program. So uh, when you receive the handouts, you'll see some of these. I have sort of the top 10 of how to care for your textiles. So the first thing is always have clean hands when touching textiles. Don't put any lotion or hand sanitizer, uh, anything like that. I add hand sanitizer, that's a new thing that I've added because uh, in the last two years with the COVID uh, pandemic, we've really been using a lot more hand sanitizer. And if you've seen places where in public that you can get the hand sanitizer and there's uh, drips all over the floor and if you spill it on something, it will actually take the color out of it. Uh, and the reason is that it has ethyl alcohol in it and it has other chemicals. It has, sometimes it has glycerin in it. Uh, glycerin is, can be very greasy. Uh, so don't use hand sanitizer right before you're working with an antique textile. That's sort of a new thing for us. Um, if you're working with it, don't have any bracelets or rings or anything with high prongs that could snag on the fabrics. Um, don't eat or drink a round of textile, even water, because sometimes if something gets wet, it can damage it. So believe it or not, yes, even a bottle of water. Um, don't smoke around the textiles because the, uh, the nicotine and the smell can actually get into the fibers. Uh, and if you're writing, this is something that we do here in the museum, don't use a pen because uh, especially new pens, the gel inks, they do not come out. Uh, they are very difficult to remove. So pencil is easier to remove than pen. Uh, keep textiles away from acidic materials such as wood, cardboard, newspaper, even the old tissue paper, uh, especially tissue paper that uh, you've had something stored in. If it's blue or pink, uh, sometimes they would use those in the past. Uh, store the textile as flat as you can. If you do have to fold something, uh, use the minimum of folds that you can. Uh, and pad out those creases with some acid-free tissue or some cloth that's clean. And then also, if you don't have it on display, cover it because uh, dust can end up uh, damaging uh, the surface of textiles over time. Uh, and also light, you'll see in a moment. Uh, if something falls off or becomes detached, 
uh, you can get some of those little uh, polyethylene bags. Um, a lot of times they sell uh, jewelry parts or buttons or things like that in these uh, polyethylene bags. Um, the Ziploc type bags that we have here in the United States, they will work in a pinch, uh, but we don't know if they're actually the correct type of uh, plastic or not. And you'll see a little bit later what plastic does. And also, if you have any questions, consult a conservator. Now, this is one of the questions that I get a lot of times, and that is, do I wear gloves or not? Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you have to wear the white gloves like a curator wears. Um, yes and no. And we are sort of rethinking that because we are finding that the cotton gloves are actually leaving things behind like lint. Uh, they can keep embedded dirt and oils uh, in the fibers, especially the fingertips. Uh, and uh, that's hard to remove. And also uh, the white gloves, they're just very bulky and hard to use. Uh, so what we are recommending now is wearing nitrile gloves. Um, a lot of these are available at drug stores or big box stores. Uh, they don't have to be purple. Some of them are black. Some of them are sort of a neutral color. Uh, they're, they can be light blue, um, but you will see them uh, listed as nitrile. Nitrile means that they are resistant to a lot of different chemicals. And especially if you're working with something that is very dirty, or it might have been exposed to something like a, a chemical, maybe arsenic or something else like that, then you wanna protect your hands. Uh, but the rule now is to just wash your hands really clean with uh, soap and water, preferably a soap that doesn't have a lot of scent to it um, because the scent could transfer to the textile. Uh, so, Mainly keep it to a minimum and just have clean hands. So that's the question on the gloves. So as I said, uh, light is very damaging to textiles. That is, as, as you uh, learn your conservation trade, that is the first thing they teach you, that light is the most damaging factor to textiles. It is cumulative and it is completely irreversible. Uh, this is from our collection. It's uh, this piece I believe was the accession. Um, as you can see that it was a much darker pink and now it's almost sort of a taupe color. And the reason why is, is because it was exposed to light. Um, UV light is extremely damaging, uh, not only to, to textiles, but to papers, the photographs, to everything. So be careful about when you're displaying your textiles, where you're displaying them, uh, because you wanna keep that light to a minimum. Uh, I know that some people, when they go to have something like a sampler or a christening dress, something like that, uh, mounted in a shadow box, um, you have a choice of if you want acrylic that has a UV coating on it. And that is very helpful uh, because that will help reduce that UV light getting to that textile. Uh, so remember that light is one of the worst things that can happen to a textile. And once that is damaged, there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, one of the next things I wanna talk about that is uh, really damaging to textiles is humidity uh, and temperature. Um, especially here in the Southern United States, it gets very hot and humid. And we have found recently that it can do that even in the winter time. Uh, so, I always recommend to people do not store textiles in an attic or a basement. Yes, a lot of these textiles, you find them in attics or basements. That's where they've been stored uh, for many, many years. But unfortunately, it can cause more damage. Um, and these temperature and humidity uh, increases and decreases during the year can actually uh, work on the textile uh, if you if the, temp, the humidity goes up, you get a lot of moisture in the textiles, especially uh, textiles like cotton and linen, cellulosics. They love to retain that moisture. If you've ever felt your t-shirts in the summertime hanging in, the, in a house that doesn't have a lot of humidity controls and they feel sort of damp, uh, well, that's 
that's the humidity going up. And also the opposite is true if the humidity goes down, especially like right now, we have less than 20% humidity, it dries out the textile and that could be very damaging to the fibers as well. Also mold can be a very bad health hazard, especially people who are uh, compromised with breathing with like COPD. Um, if you've ever been around something uh, that has mold on it, you know it, it, it has a smell to it. Um, especially uh, with old books, you, sometimes you go to old libraries and you have that, that old book smell, some of it can actually be mold. And mold will show a lot of times by spotting on fibers. It can be either little black spots, green spots. Uh, it can be white, especially if it's on something like uh, leather or sometimes upholstery. So mold can show in many different ways. And uh, the point is to get rid of this organism. Uh, there are treatments that can be done uh, that conservators can help you with. Um, what you can do at home is to air out the textile. Uh, that is the first line of defense. Uh, this is where uh, airing out and taking it outside is uh, better than having it in an inside environment. Uh, yes, I know light is damaging, but if you can put it outside in an area that doesn't get a lot of light, um, but uh, this is the conundrum is that the light actually helps kill the organism. Uh, so this is where the UV light is actually good, uh, but don't leave it out a, uh, for a long time. Also, we see a lot of leathers that get uh, mold and mildew on them. Um, if you just take a, a cloth or a, a cotton um, pad or something like that, just put a little bit of rubbing alcohol on it very lightly and gently wipe. Um, that will get mold off of shoes, uh, leather bags, things like that. You don't necessarily want to use it on a, a textile, like a cellulosic textile, like the quilt in the picture, um, but something like leather that's uh, sort of a, a stiff surface like that, uh, that will help kill the organism. Uh, for the next thing, common types of uh, damage that you will see. Uh, I just wanted to talk about this because a lot of people go, well, I don't know what happened to it. Well, this is just sort of to tell you what happened to it. Um, these are two quilts that are from our collection here at the museum, and a lot of times you will see them in quilts uh, and dress fabrics, things like that. Uh, you'll see these brown spots um, because the dyes are usually, uh, the, especially older textiles, have a lot of tannins in them. They would use tannic acid. Uh, if you've ever done experiments with black walnuts, uh, with dyeing things, that has a lot of tannic acid in it. You don't even need a mortar. Uh, but literally it burns a hole through the textile. It, it sort of eats through, basically the acid is so strong uh, that over many, many years, it will actually break down and uh, deteriorate uh, that particular area of the fabric. Uh, a lot of this happens mainly in textiles before the 1860s, when that, and that's when you see synthetic dyes. Uh, it, so natural dyes are extremely vulnerable to this. It's what we call inherent vice. Uh, and you'll hear that term in a lot of different things with textiles. Uh, it's the tendency of a material to sort of self-destruct because of what it's made out of, the construction, some other defect. Um, a lot of times more modern textiles will have inherent vice. And you'll see an example of that in a minute. Uh, you can see here uh, the, the dark brown sort of presents itself with a haze around the area. Um, the textile on the left has actually been, it was cleaned many years ago by uh, another conservator and uh, stabilized in those really dark brown areas. But you can see that the surrounding areas, the sort of lighter colored, uh, sort of tannish taupe color, uh, sort of has a haze around it. And that is because of the tannins and the dye are just sort of leaching out into the surrounding fabric. Uh, a lot of times you will see iron gall inks used. Uh, on the right is uh, from one of the flags in our collection. It has sort of a sort of memento on it and it was written on a cotton fabric with iron gall ink. And the ink is literally sort of just destroyed itself. You can see, especially in that little red area that some of the numbering and the lettering 
uh, so eating holes through it because of the, uh, the iron gall ink. You'll see these a lot on sort of commemorative textiles or a, a lot of times you'll see it on quilts, autograph quilts, they'll so use inks. And if they are using iron gall inks, you have to keep an eye on it because this is what could happen. Uh, staining is another thing that happens to textiles. And this is one of the things you'll see a lot. Uh, staining can come from lots of different sources. Uh, they can come from water, which is one of the most common uh, skin oils, uh, especially on necklines and collars, uh, cuffs, things like that, where any, anywhere where a uh, person's uh, body oils have come in contact with a fiber, uh, it will get sort of an oily, oily greasy stain. Uh, ink, as I had mentioned before, uh, will stain textiles and especially the newer inks are really bad because they do not come out with the gel inks. Uh, also, if you're looking at uh, natural dyes, again, this is from a sampler uh, on the very right, uh, you will see a lot of times the greens are not stable. In the 18th and early 19th century, the green dyes uh, were a, a achieved by mixing blue dye, indigo, with some type of yellow dye. And what happens is, over time, that yellow dye sort of disappears and a lot of the blue dye is left. That's why you see a lot of these old samplers that are sort of a turquoise color instead of blue or green. Uh, the yellow is sort of disappearing. Uh, but if they get wet, uh, they can sort of, uh, the dye can bleed into the other fibers of, of the sampler or whatever the, the textile might be. You can see that sort of in that green uh, sort of uh, tree looking area. Uh, some more areas, as I said before, skin oils and food stains. This is a 1930s dress, maybe a little hard to see in uh, uh, on the screen, but you can see where she sort of wiped her hands on the side of her dress, uh, at least sort of a yellowish stain. Uh, this is very common with more utilitarian type textiles. Uh, soot from where something has been in a fire or near a a fireplace, something like that. Uh, rust stains, you'll see a lot of these. You see from hangers and from other pins, things like that where uh, things have come in contact with. And yes, you will even see a 70 year old forgotten Tootsie Roll in the pocket. Uh, this was an object from our uh, collection that I had to clean recently. Uh, that dark brown staining that you see is actually a Tootsie Roll that uh, from the late 1940s, uh, sorry, late 1930s, early 40s, that melted in the uh, top pocket. And so it had completely melted and permeated through the lining of this coat and also almost to the front of the coat. So you can see all kinds of different stains. Oops. Uh, silk fabrics. Uh, a lot of times you'll see this in quilts, um, but it can happen in other garments as well. Silk fabrics tend to do something that we call crash. And crashing means that it is uh, just splitting and completely destroying itself. As you can see in the top right corner, um, that's one of the worst case scenarios. This is a flag from our collection. And all those little bits that you see are silk fibers. Uh, now, one of the reasons that this happens is because the silk is weighted. From about the 1860s until the 1920s, uh, silk fabrics uh, had a tendency to, um, when they manufactured them, they would manufacture them with metallic uh, salts, mainly out of tin. And the reason why is they would make the fabric heavier. Uh, it would give that nice rustle that you always think of with like late 19th century textiles. You think of your bustle dresses that rustle when a woman walks. Uh, they could also sell it for more money. Um, but unfortunately, one of the, the problems with this is that inherent vice, as I said before, is that these uh, tend have a tendency to sort of split and crash and self-destruct. Uh, the textile that you see at the lower right that has beautiful pink lining, that is a lining of a coat from 1915 that we have in our collection. And what happened was even when the person started wearing it, uh, it started destroying itself. <laughs> and we can tell this because uh, she tried to make some repairs to it. So uh, 
crashing is very common. You will see this a lot of times, splitting and crashing of textiles. Uh, and sometimes in quilts, you'll have only a few areas that do it uh, and the rest of the textile will be fine. Uh, so we'll take a talk about uh, how to fix that in a minute. Fabrics can have old repairs to them or they can have tears that have happened. Uh, if it has an old repair, sometimes the repair needs to be removed because it can actually be damaging to the textile. Uh, on the very left, uh, that is a dress from the 1820s and you can see that sometime in the past that somebody put a little patch underneath there. Um, well, we need to remove that because the original fabric is very, very thin, it's very fine, and those big stitches with those threads are actually damaging to it. Uh, so you have to be careful of things that have old repairs. They can actually sort of distort the fabric and uh, the threads used to stitch it can be tight, and sometimes those have to be removed. Now, sometimes you can leave them, but again, that's when you consult a professional. Uh, this is another thing that's very common is uh, fume fading or discoloring from perspiration stains. Uh, the dress on the very far left, uh, the dark green, that has perspiration stains underneath it, but that is from unstable dyes. That dress is from uh, the early 19th century. Uh, and body salts uh, and other chemicals in our sweat, in our, um, our body oils can cause this uh, to react with natural dyes and cause discoloring. Uh, the dress in the middle is from the 1920s. This is when you start to see the beginning of the use of modern antiperspirants, uh, aluminum salts uh, and other types of salts that they're using in those. This is a silk dress and it's actually caused discoloration and it's also caused the dress to start splitting as well. And fume fading, uh, it's an interesting sort of thing that happens. This is the dress on the very right. Um, this is one of our North Carolina first ladies dresses. Uh, the sort of sheer overlay that you see used to be a light blue, the same as the lace that's in the top of the bodice. But what has happened is it's made out of a modern uh, fabric, synthetic fabric, it's an acetate, and it has actually turned pink. Uh, a lot of times this does happen in acetate. It is part of the nature of that particular fabric. And uh, usually blues will go pink, pink will go blue, green will go brown and brown will go green. Uh, it's, it's a very strange sort of thing. And again, once that happens, there's really nothing that you can do to get the color to change back. It is going to continue to do that just because of what it's made out of. Uh, boxing is another thing that you will see a lot of times. You'll see a lot of little brown spots. Um, I put the uh, paper on the left just so you can see because you'll see a lot of old books have boxing on them. Same thing uh, with rayon and cotton. These are what we call cellulosic fibers and it's part of sort of the nature of the fiber and the way that it degrades is you'll get this spotting, this boxing on top of it. It can be reduced. Um, uh, there are treatments that conservators can use to reduce this, but sometimes it actually uh, sort of stains the fabric and it's difficult to get rid of. Uh, pests, I didn't mention pests in my first uh, top 10, but this is another thing that's very, uh, damaging to textiles. Now here in the South, this is the number one. This is carpet beetles. And these are teeny tiny little bugs. They are about the side of a mustard seed. Um, I'm sure you've seen them in your house. They come from outside, but they take a ride in on your clothing. Uh, you, you look at them and you find them and you go, well, how did this even get into my house? And they can find a way in. Uh, if you've ever, uh, unfolded a fabric, whether it's a more modern one or something that is an antique, and you see this fluffy little casing, uh, as you can see, and on the right, that sort of top area, it leaves this little fluffy brown casing. If you've ever seen that, then at some point it has had carpet beetles. Uh, they love warm climates, uh, so they love the south, and they love dark areas. Uh, they love to eat mainly protein. They eat silk wool. They love feathers, especially old feathered hats, furs, any skin, anything that has skin oils on it, any oily stains, that's what they love to eat. 
Uh, and a lot of times you'll see small areas where they've been grazing. The best way to get rid of them is not to get them at all, but that's very, very difficult here uh, and with our climate. Uh, and so preventive treatment is the best, is to vacuum. And I'll be talking about vacuuming in a minute, and vacuuming is also one of your hand acts that you will have as well too. Another pest that we have here in the South and then uh, also in Northern areas, for those of you who are from other parts of the United States uh, or overseas joining us, web and clothes moths. Um, it's mainly the larvae that do, do the damage, even though uh, the moths themselves will do a lot of damage. Uh, they spin sort of this little uh, spider web like cocoon and the larvae eat the surface on the surface of the fabric. And what they will leave behind are these tiny little beads, a lot like sand, and it's called frass. And you can you know that something has been infested with uh, clothes moths if there are these little bits of grit falling out of the textile when you pick it up. You see these a lot on coverlets uh, that are woven with wool yarn. Um, and that is the frass that is coming out. Uh, they love to eat protein fibers. And when I say they eat the fibers, they actually don't eat the fibers. They want what's actually on the surface of, of this fabric. They are actually eating whatever stains might be there that may not be seen. They're eating the wools. So sometimes you can actually see a textile that sort of uh, the nap or the surface of the fiber has been sort of eaten away a little bit. You won't have a hole there. Um, but it's been, been eaten a little bit. That's called grazing. And that way you know that uh, some type of uh, moth has been there. The larvae has been eating that. Again, uh, they can be controlled with vacuuming. And also there are pheromones uh, traps. They're very expensive. We use them in the museum, but there are ways that you can get rid of them. Now, I always have people say, well, what about mothballs? I had one of my professors tell me uh, in graduate school, she said, mothballs only work if you can throw it and hit the moth. Uh, mothballs are very dangerous to humans and to animals. They are made with a chemical called parafluorodibenzene or naphthalene. Uh, some of the older ones are naphthalene. Uh, those are two very, very dangerous chemicals. Um, I know here in the South, there's this sort of um, folklore of putting moth files outside to get rid of snakes. Um, it's very damaging to the soil and it does not get rid of the snakes. Uh, so think twice when you get moth balls because they actually, uh, the smell and the chemical, if they come in contact with fibers, are very hard to get at. Uh, we had a uh, military um, uh, uniform that I had to put in a sealed chamber for three weeks just to get the smell out of it. Uh, and it never came completely out. I just wanted to mention some other pests. Uh, we have on the left, we have silverfish here in uh, North America. We have also roaches. You uh, really don't think of roaches, but they do eat textiles, especially um, cellulosic textiles. And they leave behind little black droppings and it can actually stain uh, dresses. I've seen this in wedding dresses and other things that have been stored. Uh, with roaches, it's not necessarily the textile itself, but what it may be stored in. Uh, so if you have those old uh, boxes that you stored your wedding dress in, uh, it's not the wedding dress they want, it's the cardboard box they want. And they will be hidden in between those little corrugations inside the cardboard and you won't be able to see them. Uh, so get rid of those old boxes, put it in a newer acid-free box uh, and monitor it. Also crickets and grasshoppers, they will eat textiles. And also I just wanna mention um, squirrels, uh, mice and birds. If you are keeping something or you find it in an attic or a basement, uh, especially attics, squirrels will chew on clothing uh, and textiles and mice to make nests and birds uh, will leave uh, excrement all over it. Um, I've seen that happen on uniforms, uh, if they're in garages, so forth. So I just wanted to mention those pests as well. Uh, other types of damage you can see from uh, things like wax blossoms, uh, cellulose nitrate, which is a 20th century invention. Um, most people think of films, but there are a lot of things like cones, pocketbook handles, uh, those types of things that are made of cellulose nitrate. It self-destructs. 
uh, and it can be very dangerous because it can be combustible. Uh, and also mat modern materials uh, on the right is a coat that is less than 10 years old. It was bought here in North Carolina and it is made out of polyurethane. And as you can see, it's already uh, degrading, it's flaking and the whole surface is coming apart. It's just completely falling apart. So that's part of the future is what's gonna happen. Uh, now that we have 20th century materials, anything past World War II, um, a lot of these new textiles, they have uh, silver threads in them, copper threads, they have bamboo, they have all different types of new fibers that they're using in clothing. Some of them may be coated with something, they may be treated with something, so we don't know exactly how they're going to react. Um, this is a great example. This is, uh, if you remember the Back to the Future movie, uh, this is Mike, one of the uh, self-lacing Nikes that Michael J. Fox wore. Uh, it was made for a movie, so it wasn't really meant to last anyway, but this is what's happening to the sort of foam components uh, to it. We're, I've also seen articles from uh, the Nike company that their other, their Air Jordans, their first generation, they are, the foam is actually falling apart and there's nothing they can do about it. So the next generation of conservators will be having to deal with this sort of problem of what do we do with things that really weren't meant to be saved? So it's a big question. What are we going to do to it? Uh, there's a lot of research out there right now of what to do. Uh, so it's something to think about. So if you need help, and this is the best uh, website that I can recommend. This is the American Institute for Conservation. Uh, there are international members as well too. They are sort of the governing body uh, for um, conservators. And you can go to the website and find the how to select a conservator um, section. And they will help you find someone who is in whatever field you are looking for. Uh, as a note, conservators do not appraise objects. Uh, if you have a conservator that wants to tell you how much something is worth, run. That is something we do not do. It is a conflict of interest to us. Uh, there are appraisal societies that are available for that. Uh, this information will also be on the handout that will be available. Now, something that you can do at home, vacuuming is the simplest solution. Uh, it's very easy to do. I like to get the, uh, as you see in the center, the little micro attachments that are used for vacuuming computer keyboards, things like that. Those are great to use with a vacuum. You do not want to use a very strong vacuum like a Dyson. Dyson will take paint off the walls. Those things are so strong. But if you have sort of a canister vacuum, an older style, you can either use the upholstery attachments or you can use the micro attachments. You actually put a piece of netting or stocking on the end of the nozzle and you can vacuum it um, very safely. Be careful of vacuuming anything that has beading on it or feathers or things that might be loose because you don't want to get that sucked up into the vacuum cleaner. Um, the next thing that you can do is uh, covering fabrics. Um, a lot of quilters love to do this. You can get a nylon netting and it can be close to the same color fabric and you use 100% cotton thread to stitch over the area that is damaged. A lot of times this is uh, something we do with quilting, but it can be done with other fabrics as well too. Um, I always have a lot of people asking me, well, can I wash it in my washing machine? Can I clean it myself? Can I clean it in my bathtub? Um, use caution uh, when doing that. Sometimes uh, no type of, of solvent can be used on a fabric uh, or it's a solvent that you as a person, a general person, not a conservator cannot get um, a hold of uh, because they're, uh, specifically for labs and things like that. Now, there is a caveat that sometimes modern quilts, and I'm talking things that are made from the 1950s onwards, can be washed in a washing machine, either just by hand or by using the gentle cycle. But remember that that spin cycle, uh, that is what, is what happens to older quilts. This quilt is from the 1930s 
and it has completely destroyed it. So what wet cleaning, that is something that I do not rem uh, rem recommend for those who are non-conservators. Uh, even as conservators, we are extremely cautious when we are wanting to wet clean something. We have to make a lot of decisions uh, because you don't know what can happen in whatever, if something starts to happen to that textile, it is irreversible. So I don't necessarily recommend wet cleaning for someone uh, who is not adept at it. So storage, um, acid-free boxes, that is your best bet. Um, there are alternatives. Not all acid-free boxes are created equal. Some of the older boxes that wedding dresses were stored in are not necessarily acid free. We have found that to be true here in the museum. Um, when things come into a collection, uh, the boxes that they were stored in uh, were actually just cardboard boxes. And they say that they're acid free and that they're heirloom preservation boxes. There are lots of terms that they like to use, um, but they are not acid free. So always buy from reputable sources and you will have some sources listed on the hand act uh, that you will be given. Avoid these types of containers. I know a lot of people like to reuse the comforter or mattress bags. Uh, also the plastic storage boxes, people ask me about those. Um, if they have no holes in them, then they can be damaging to the textiles inside. Uh, plastic dry cleaning bags are awful. Shopping bags, uh, you're beginning to see less and less the plastic and vinyl garment bags, uh, which is a good thing. They're going away. Um, this is what happens to dry cleaning bags over time. Uh, they completely disintegrate. Uh, the plasticizers, as with modern textiles that are made with more plastic type materials, uh, they can off gas chemicals, they start to break down. Uh, they can cause dyes to change. They can cause staining on fabrics, especially dry cleaning bags, uh, other deterioration in fabrics. Uh, the, as I said, with the plastic tubs, they can create, create a microclimate. And if you have a high humidity, it can cause mold to grow if there's any moisture in the textiles. Wire and plastic hangers. Yes, Joan was right, no wire hangers. Uh, the reason why is because we see a lot of, especially military uniforms that people hung away after the war, especially World War II. And on the inside, the lining will be stained with iron rust because the wire hangers got wet or they didn't have a good coating. And so they have actually stained the garment. Uh, plastic is just as bad because they have plasticizers in them. They are very weak, they can break. Uh, so I don't recommend those as well either. So what can we use? Uh, padded hangers are also uh, an alternative. You can uh, use the clamp style hanger for trousers or skirts. Uh, bags that are made out of either muslin or cloth or canvas cloth or Tyvek. Uh, you can get those from archival supplies. Uh, those are great alternatives for putting clothing in it. Uh, you can also roll textiles, small textiles like lace or uh, things like that that are very small or even big textiles like a flag uh, can be rolled on acid-free tubes that are also available from archival sources. If you have to store it in a trunk or a drawer or something like that that is made out of wood, this is an old trick. Uh, line it with aluminum foil first. Yes, aluminum foil that you have in your kitchen. If you've ever seen, especially white textiles that have a dark brown stain, that's the acid in the wood that's coming out and staining that particular area. Uh, so line it with aluminum foil, and then you can use your good friend, the sheets and pillowcases uh, as a barrier between the aluminum foil and the textile. And you can also use it as an alternative to an acid-free box. Uh, unfortunately, acid-free materials are getting more expensive. Uh, we have seen with COVID that materials are harder to get, therefore getting more expensive. Uh, with your old sheets, the, the clean white cotton sheets are the best. Uh, wash them a couple of times in hot water with a scent-free detergent and then you can just wrap your textile in that. It's really good because you can see if anything falls off. If there's pests in there, you can see the frass, you can see all kinds of things in there. 
So old sheets and pillowcases are your friends. Uh, I just wanna mention display because there are so many different ways of displaying textiles uh, because uh, they, they just go on and on and on. You can see quilts. A lot of quilters now are putting these uh, loops on the back of their quilts so that people can hang them. Uh, samplers and small textiles can be mounted on fabric covered acid free board, um, especially sports jerseys. People love to have these framed now. Uh, christening dresses, uh, wedding dresses, you know, things like that can be done as well. Um, I, I will mention that uh, with christening dresses and other things in a shadow box, you want to have a reputable company that is doing it. Um, if they want to wire or staple or glue or do something like that, run streaming, only work with people who are willing to stitch or possibly pin using very fine pins uh, the items because any of the rest of that can be damaging. I have seen a World War II leather bomber jacket that was literally wired to uh, the back of a shadow box frame uh, and it literally left holes in the leather and it was nothing you could do. Uh, quilt racks, yes, you can use them. Uh, this particular one in the picture, I would have actually put a piece of fabric or old sheet over it first. Um, and of course you have for flags, uh, memory, uh, things like that. You have a lot of memory frames. Some of them are wood, but most of the time they are sealed. Uh, the flag will probably never be un undone. It will always be in that configuration. So uh, those are pretty safe uh, to, to use. So there are a lot of different ways to display your textiles, but remember that light is one of the worst and molding, uh, mildew, humidity, that type of thing. So I do have some resources here. Um, I'll leave this up for a few, uh, just a, a minute or two so that people can see this. These are books for the lay person. Um, and there are about four of them that are really good. Yes, they are a little older, but uh, the information is still the same. Also, I have included on here our North Carolina Museum of History website. 90% uh, of what I've told you today can be found on our website in our How to Care for Textiles section. There is also a website from the Smithsonian uh, that also, uh, this is the index that tells you how to care for lots of different types of artifacts, but textiles are on there as well. It's a little technical, um, but it is for the lay person, not, not necessarily uh, conservators. Uh, as you see here, these are three uh, companies that sell um, acid-free uh, materials, Gaylord University and Talus. Um, most individuals work with either Gaylord or University because they work with um, libraries, they work with museums, they work with individuals, they work with everybody. And also I've put on here at the bottom, uh, hangerbee.com. It's a fairly new company. This lady makes a museum quality padded hangers. You can use the, the old uh, lingerie hangers in a pinch, uh, but it's better to have one that's made specifically for hanging archival textiles. Um, some of this information will be on uh, the handout that you see that you will get. Um, I did not put the Smithsonian, uh, that's not on there, and the hangar bee is not on there, uh, but the rest of the information is. So I am going to turn it back over to Michelle, and we will answer any questions if there are any. There are several. Thank you, Paige. That was very informative. <laughs> Um, I do want to reiterate, just in case uh, some people tuned in late and didn't hear me say it and haven't heard it in the chat, you have developed two handouts, which contain much of the information, sort of a summary and some of the key points that you've gone over today. You're going to share those with me. You just finished them this week. And I have a list of everybody who registered. So I'm just going to send that a mass email out to everyone. So there'll be people who registered who didn't show up. Um, I'll explain in the email while you while they're getting these handouts. But for those of you that are here, um, I hope to do that next week. We have over uh, 200 people registered, so I'm going to do it in bunches. But uh, so it's going to take me a little while to work through them, but I will get to everyone. Um, if you haven't received your email by the end of next week, give me the whole week, uh, feel free to contact me. I'm Michelle Carr. I work at the Museum of History. You can call the museum number 
gosh, a seven, zero, oh, wait a minute, eight one nine one nine eight one four seven thousand. It changed a few years ago and I haven't quite made that that click. Um, you can also look me up. I'm Michelle with two L's dot car, C-A-R-R at ncdcr.gov. And I'll just take care of sending that out for you. Now let's jump into some of the questions and they're in no particular order. They're sort of as I wrote them down, as people sent them. Um, some of them uh, were sort of follow-up questions to some things you mentioned. You started out by talking about the danger of, well, or being concerned about transferring oils and lotions and things from your skin to fabrics. And we had a question about natural lotions like bee balm. Is that any better or is that just as harmful? Um, anything that you're going to be adding onto your skin, um, it, it's going to create some type of grease or oil, even the ones that are natural, beeswax as well too. Um, some of those natural ones, they're nice. They don't have a lot of scent to them, um, but I would be very cautious. If you do have to use lotion, and we have been here in the South because it has been very dry here, I make sure that at least an hour or two uh, that I've used it before I'm gonna work with a textile, and then I wash my hands really well with soap and water. Um, but you know, it, you can use it, but give yourself some time for that to soak into your skin. Uh, and then wash your hands, get the clean hands with soap and water. That's what I would do. But wear those mean, nitrate you, gloves, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. over that too would help. The nitrile gloves are really good when you don't know what you're working with. There are some things that have been treated with chemicals. Um, we always think of like taxidermy things that have arsenic on them. Um, but a lot of times we don't know what somebody has treated something with. And also things that have been stored in boxes um, back in the 1950s, especially, they loved to use chemicals uh, to sort of preserve things. Um, we had an example here where somebody brought in a 1950s wedding dress, and it had this beautiful silvery fabric that was lining it. And I said, well, what is that? And there were three of us who were opening this box. And come to find out, less than an hour later, we were having burning eyes and throats and noses and what? I think had happened is I looked up the, the whatever this silver fabric was and it was called a vapor uh, barrier. Ah, so what happened was that the textile itself had been cleaned in something, probably carbon tetrachloride because that was a common dry cleaning solvent, which is very dangerous to humans. And all of that vapor had been stored in that box. And when we opened it up, it released. So, be careful about stuff like that. You know, you, we, I did handle that particular object with gloves, so I didn't have any carbon tetrachloride residue on my hands, but be, be careful of things like that. Sort of staying with some of the lotion and the cleansing materials, there was a question about soaps. Does it yeah. matter? A person wanted to know. I have a feeling the answer is going to be yes here, but <laughs> does it matter if you're using a commercial soap, a lye-based soap, or a lanolin-based soap? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it really does not matter. Um, the lanolin soap will be a little greasier. Um, of course, most soaps are made, are basically made with lye and uh, sodium hydroxide and an oil. Um, as long as it doesn't have a lot of scent to it. Um, I like using more natural soaps. Um, ivory soap uh, is available uh, pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, things like that for washing your hands. Um, as long as it doesn't have a lot of scent to it and your hands are clean. And, and I know a lot of people have problems with parabens and things like that now. Use a soap that you feel comfortable with as long as you get the oils off of your hands. You're good. We um, have some uh, questions for people about various stains. And I know this is something that I've run into. This is probably one of your more common questions. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of things, you know, getting food on fabric. You've talked about deodorant, you body deodorant because of perspiration stains, even with deodorant. And sometimes the deodorants contribute to the stain. Right. Also, um, you know, I had my pet interrupt. We love our pets. Pets leave stains um, <laughs> um, and babies sometimes. And we had some questions. I, I, I It's a little indelicate, but urine from a, a pet or something quite as invasive as that can We've had a, pet, a patron who had that problem. And as a pet owner, I can understand. <laughs> yes, 
someone who owns a cat, I understand. Yeah. And uh, cats like to um, <clears throat> regurgitate too. Uh, so yes, I, that, that leaves stains on things too because it's very acidic. Um, yeah, th these are very common stains. And with newer fabric, if you wash them out, go ahead, you know, do your modern treatments to your more modern textiles. Um, there are some times that things can't be removed. Um, things like vomit, it's very hard because it's very acidic. Uh, same thing with cats. <laughs> um, urine is not necessarily a pet, but it also can be human as well too, um, uh, from people who have been sick, whatever. Um, so this is when you consult your conservator if it's an antique textile. Um, if it's something more modern, there are, are you know, you can look at different uh, detergents, you can look at different cleansers, there's OxyClean, things like that. OxyClean is basically sodium percarbonate, um, which is uh, what they used to call your uh, color safe bleach. Um, there are a lot of things out there. It, it's mainly for the older textiles. Um, as conservers, we do have ways to reduce uh, staining, uh, like the perspiration stains uh, and urine stains and other stains like that. We do have ways that we can reduce it, but sometimes if something is made out of a fabric that we can't clean with a certain solvent, and you may not have access to that particular solvent. Uh, so with your modern textiles, go ahead, use your modern treatments. But with older textiles, they tend to be weaker. And when I say modern textiles, I'm talking anything World War II and beyond. Good. I was going to ask you how, how you're defining that term because that, um, that might mean something different in the museum world than to the general yes. public. Uh, the reason that I uh, delineate it there is because um, around World War II is why, when we start really seeing more uh, synthetic fabrics. Um, and this is a problem today as well, too. And I have this in my own house that I am uh, worried about as well. I have a lot of uh, these sports clothing. Uh, that are made out of polyester. Well, they are advertising a lot now that, okay, you, you know, you wash your polyester, you wash your workout clothes, but they still stink. And that is true. And the reason why is because polyesters and synthetics are oleophilic, which means they are oil loving. They will just love that skin oil. And the more you sweat, the more you perspire, the more uh, oils you get on it, the stinkier it will get. And so there are new uh, types of detergents being developed that will actually counteract the uh, nature, that oleophilic nature of the polyester and actually clean uh, the, the dirt and the oils uh, that will make it smell better. Uh, I've been investigating this myself because I put on my, you know, my polyester uh, microfiber shirt and I'm like, oh, geez, I just washed this. Uh, so yeah. This is what I was talking about with more modern fabrics. How are we going to clean these in the future? Um, we have things like this that are in our museum collections now. We have uh, an Olympic speed skater outfit that's made out of three or four different types of fabrics that are these modern fabrics. Well, how do we clean them? So we continually have to uh, decide what kind of solvents, what type of chemicals are we going to use? What's going to be best for the textile that's not going to destroy it. And a lot of our modern things that we have today are not made to last. Um, if it's silk, wool, linen, or cotton, I can pretty much tell you what to do with it. Um, these more modern fabrics, we haven't quite figured out what to do yet because it hasn't been that long. So I hope that helps answer that question. We, we've had a lot of questions about cotton. So I think people have inherited family items or they are their own or maybe even quilts. Mm -hmm. um, with stains, and I know you, you really need to, to speak to that, you know, it's ideally you would see the stain, but right. in general, if people have some yellowing or brown stains on these cotton fabrics, let's say they're, they could be from the 60s, or they could be, but they're, they're natural cotton. Right. What are the right. best tips? That's the fabric we get the most questions, that we've gotten the most questions right. about today. If it's more of a modern uh, fabric, you can use your more modern types of detergent, so forth. Um, I, I will mention this, and I said I wouldn't, but I will. Um, there is a, a chemical out there, it's a, it's a um, detergent, and some of you may have heard of it, it's called Orbis. Uh, there are others out there on the market called Uplan. Um, 
they're different brands and they sell them as quilt soap or, you know, heirloom, you know, soaps, things like that. And as long as it doesn't have any perfume in it, that's the reason I like the Orvis. Uh, you can buy it in smaller amounts. Now I have actually seen it at Joanne Fabric before. I don't know if they have it now. Um, the way that conservators buy it, we buy it in a five pound uh, container. Or, or these jars that are one pound because we use a lot of it, but you only need a tiny little bit. It is extremely concentrated. It is made of sodium lauryl sulfate and sodium lauryl sulfate, which are the two chemicals that you find in most all of your dish detergents and shampoos and soaps. Yes, I know that some people are averse to these because they, they you know, do have these chemicals in them, um, but you do need them as cleaners. Um, so, I would recommend that, you know, something probably from the 50s or 60s, you can wash it in a little bit of that. And I'm talking like a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon. Uh, a little goes a long way. Uh, this Orvis product was originally developed to clean animals like show horses, pigs, things like that. You can use it on your hair. I've done it. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's just basically the main ingredient that you get in most soaps and uh, detergents. But you can use that if you, and I do say this with warning, if you do want to clean something by hand, either in a small basin or a bathtub, you can use the Orvis. Uh, there are instructions out there on how to do it, but I highly recommend that you consult a professional first because it may look very simplistic, just wet cleaning. Of, you know, I've wet cleaned Barbie clothes that had you know, the brown staining on it. And it may seem very simplistic, but all the time I'm thinking, what is this fiber? What is it made out of? How is it going to react? What is the stain? Is the stain set? Am I going to be able to get it out? Do I need something to add to the detergent to help get the stain out? So there's a lot of things that we think about. There's a lot of chemistry involved in conservation. So it's not just wet, wet cleaning a Barbie dress or, a, you know, a, a christening dress or something like that. It's what are these stains? How is it gonna react in the fiber? What's going to happen? If something starts to break down, what do I do? I have to stop immediately and I have to reverse that process because anything that's done is done. So you can do it, but take it with a grain of salt. Um, your more modern things are okay, but something like a sampler, something that's a very old quilt that might have silk in it, um, I don't even recommend wet cleaning silk, uh, sorry, well, wet cleaning cotton quilts at all either, because it's a very laborious process, even for museums, and it takes several people, and it takes a lot of time, and it takes several days. So um, sometimes we just spot clean the area. Uh, and when I see people that have quilts, well, you know, it's part of the history of the quilt. Now, if it's something damaging, we will try to remove it. Um, but most of the time, these little brown foxing spots, it's part of the aging process of the cotton and you can't do a lot with it. Just call it patina on fabric and learn call to it love it. Call it patina if you want to call it <laughs> patina. But um, unless it's something that's really damaging, um, I would recommend just keeping an eye on it. Well, you, you've, um, I always think of a mantra. I, I'm not a conservationist, but I, the little bit I know about it is you're, you're trying to, to make sure what you do is if as much as possible, um, do nothing that isn't reversible because right. you mentioned, you know, don't wire, don't glue. You can tack, you can use tacking, you can use right. things. Right. It can be undone. That's not permanently damaging or altering the, uh, right. the fabric or the material. Right. And, and, and that we, is, did, that is, yeah. we did have some audience members mention Orvis. So that's something that sounds like okay. people are, are familiar with. Yeah. If they're using it properly, it, it can work. Um, the challenge I, is yeah. you address that quilts and even contemporary clothes can have multiple fabrics in them and true. require different techniques to clean. That is very true. And, uh, you know, like I say, if it's, you know, the, the silks, cotton, linens, wools, those are pretty, um, if it's a cellulosic fiber, which is your cotton and your linen uh, or bamboo or rayon, even to some degree, uh, we know how to care for those. Um, and silk in this, with, silk is treated very differently. These are uh, protein fibers, silk and wool are protein fibers, and they're treated differently than cellulosics. 
But when you get start mixing in these modern materials, you have polyesters, you have polyurethanes, you have all of these different, you know, different materials. You have especially sports uh, wear that has copper infused or silver infused. Um, again, we're still trying to figure out what is the best way to care for these, especially in museum collections or even in your own collections. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily you're going to be saving your workout clothing for posterity, but you might. And these types of things do end up in museums. They do end up in collections. They, they you know, they're passed down from generation. What are we going to do to them? So um, especially quilts, and we, we always think of things like crazy quilts, because crazy quilts a lot of times are made out of silk and wool. Sometimes they'll throw some cotton fabric in there. They'll use, they use whatever they want it to. And those are very difficult to treat. And sometimes you don't actually treat it with anything. Vacuuming. Vacuuming is the simplest thing you can do. Sometimes that's the only thing you can do is vacuuming. And uh, especially with things like the, the crazy quilts with the silk, sometimes you can cover it, like I said, with the netting. Um, and that is the only treatment that can be done. And sometimes nothing can be done. Uh, you know, when you think of like the ruby slippers at the Smithsonian, it was a very long time before they could figure out just exactly what solvent to use, how to clean it, you know, because these were made out of uh, cellulose nitrate. Uh, that's why the project costs so much is because of the time and the, the money involved and in, in the you know, materials involved in cleaning it. But they had to have it at a certain temperature. They had to have you know, everything just right. So it will be interesting to see with the modern fabrics what happens. But with your, you know, your older fabrics that are you know, part linen, part wool, things like that, um, you know, they're going to be pretty stable. I mean, we have things in our collection that are over 200 years old that are more stable and better condition than things that are 50 years old. So, As you mentioned, people, uh, clothing today, is it made to last the way it used to be? It's, no, we're, it's we're a consumer society and they want things to wear out, break down by new. Um, and we're using a lot of plastics in clothing. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for everything. Um, and there's a, we talked and, about the landfill and how the fabrics are going to decay. What that's good. There's some interesting discussions about that going on. There, oh, there could be an entire program just on that because you're talking about microplastics in the ocean. Uh, and all of this is coming from these little tiny fibers that are, you know, whatever the polyesters and the other fibers that are coming off our clothing. Um, so it's something to think about for the future. We thought our straws were ruining the ocean. It's our clothes. Yes. Um, I, you were talking about quilts. I just have to mention just an example. I know someone who comes to the museum. She's a, a, a patron and a presenter at our American Indian event who brings her family summer quilts, and it's actually lined with old newspaper. I had never seen that before, but that's going to be, again, you're not something you're going to stick in your, you're not going to wet that. You're not going to want to put that in the tub. <laughs> uh, and we, and I have seen, we have some of those types of things in our collection, and this is when you need to consult with somebody who is uh, averse at other uh, areas of expertise. Uh, when we have newspapers on quilts, I consult with our objects conservator. I don't know a lot about paper, even though paper and textile conservation are very closely related. Um, I would consult with a paper conservator with something like that because the paper is gonna react differently than the cotton fabric that it's attached to. Uh, and sometimes there's nothing you can do. Uh, it, it's no, and we did get take. several <laughs> questions about books and paper, which I know we're, I'm not going to expect you to answer. What I did suggest is people visit the archives across the yes. street because they, exactly. they, we tend to defer to them for uh, works on paper, which are very fragile. Mm -hmm. And Emily Rainwater, I believe, is the conservator there. And I put her, you can look her up on the archives employment, the, uh, the staff listing. It's Emily Rainwater at ncdcr.gov. Also, they have tips on their website about conserving paper, just as you've done for textiles. So if you have questions about paper, the archives is the best place to go. But we do have an objects conservator on our staff. We're very fortunate to have two conservators at the museum. If, you, um, if you're looking for some just general information, the Smithsonian website that I showed, um, that is, that's sort of the main index. It has textiles, but it also has information on other uh, objects as well, like paper or metal or wood or something like that. Uh, sometimes things are treated 
similarly um, in, in conservation, but sometimes they're complete opposites. And it, it can be very confusing. It's, it's very technical. We, we're very scientific with our conservation and we try to you know, make sure everything is, is, is melding together and working together when you have different types of materials. But um, it, it's difficult. It really is very difficult. We have time for a few more questions, and I have tons actually, but we've talked about getting stains out of fabric, and I know you've mentioned this, but just to repeat, odors, particularly cigarette smoke, right. can really linger in fabrics uh, from when they were stored or created or worn. Yes. Maybe not um, by the current owner, <laughs> but they're there. Um, there are a couple of different things that you can do for that. Of course, baking soda uh, is always sort of the go-to, as, as is cat litter. Uh, just the clay litter, not the, not the clumping, just the clay cat litter helps get uh, scents away. But you can also use, um, and it's convenient now because if you go on Amazon or somewhere like that, you can get these bags of charcoal, activated charcoal. And activated charcoal is wonderful for removing smells. Um, don't put it on the textile. Uh, you can put it near the textile. Um, but that tends to absorb odors, um, especially strong odors like uh, smoke or food or, you know, you go to the restaurant, you go to the steak restaurant, you smell like steak when you come out. Uh, activated charcoal is good for that. And a lot of these times, a lot of times you will see on the little packets that say you can recharge it in the sun. Yes, UV light will recharge the activated charcoal. Most of the time it's made out of bamboo. Um, uh, because it's a renewable resource. But yes, that I, I highly recommend activated charcoal in the little bags. It's a lot less messy than having it as a pattern uh, in a container. Well, I keep those actually in my closet and in the room where I keep my cat's uh, litter boxes. <laughs> it's very but, good uh, for my scent, yeah. Now we've, we've talked about, uh, there's a lot of questions on storage and you, you talked about the dangers of mothballs, but people wonder about lavender sachets, cedar closets, cedar chips, some of the things that people have used or have been told oh, to yeah. use for a long time. <laughs> lavender is good, cedar is good, as long as they do not come in contact with the textile. Um, use your aluminum foil on your cedar chest, on your cedar drawers. Um, as long as the textile does not come in contact with that acid wood, you're good. Use your cedar chest, use it, you know, use your cedar chips or your lavender chest sachets. Just don't let them get in contact with the textile. If you think it's gonna work, but try to avoid chemicals because the, the perichlorodibenzene, it's really nasty stuff. I'm gonna bring up something. I, if you brought it up and I, I sort of skip, mentioned, if you mentioned it, I missed it and I apologize. You talked about some things that are just natural and part of just everyday life, like, you know, light can damage fabrics, but yet light is out there. Gravity is another natural force that can have a factor on our textiles. Uh, yes, gravity, uh, especially in the case of quilts. Um, uh, people uh, love to hang quilts. Um, I do not recommend hanging something like a crazy quilt. If you're gonna use that, uh, use it on a flat surface like a bed. Um, or if you're going to display it, do it only short amounts of time, like three to five months at a time. Um, quilts have a lot of gravity, uh, tapestries. We don't see a lot of tapestries here in the United States, but they are out there. Um, think about Biltmore State. They have huge tapestries. Well, they have linings on the back of them to help counteract that gravity. Uh, you're, you're sort of, um, the tapestry itself isn't just pulling down. You have that uh, sort of cotton lining to help it. So hanging um, on yeah. uh, in some of the hangers, even if it's a, if the hanger's been padded or storage, just right. the weight, if it's a, if it's a heavy garment, mm -hmm. uh, it would be right. ideal if you could store it flat or right. in the case of a quilt, I try to roll them, as you said, to, right. to eliminate creases. Uh, quilts, uh, they can be rolled. I like to fold quilts with a minimum okay. of holes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, they will fit in the acid-free boxes. Uh, or you can wrap them up in your sheets, your white sheets again, uh, use those. Um, definitely uh, something that's more fragile, uh, like you wouldn't hang a 1920s beaded dress, but you would put it in a box. Um, but you might hang a 1920s, 1930s cotton uh, dress made out of feed sacks. Uh, so something like that, that's you know fairly stable, you can hang uh, a lot of uniforms, they can get hung. 
Um, but things that are more fragile, silk dresses, I would recommend um, putting those either in a box or wrapping them uh, in a sheet. Uh, but the more stable things you can hang. But also keep an eye on them over time as well. Just a few more, then we'll wrap up because we've gone over our hour. Um, <laughs> when you talk about the, the cotton sheets that are our friends, someone asked about bamboo sheets. Are they as effective or do you, or no, we need to stay with the pure cotton? Um, they are cellulosic, so I, I would use those. Yeah, they're fine. And when you talk about the acid-free tissue paper, does it, uh, is it, bu whether it's buffered or not, does that make a difference? Um, yes, do not use buffered tissue paper. Uh, just use regular unbuffered acid-free tissue paper. The buffered tissue paper is only used in certain instances and even in the museum, I try not to use it. I try not to have it because um, it, only with something that's extremely acidic that you use that, it has a calcium carbonate uh, buffer to it. Um, you want, uh, when you're talking of pHs, I'm sure if you've got a pool, you understand pH. Uh, that 14 uh, is very, uh, um, sorry, acidic, and, and one is very basic, sorry, is very basic, one is very acidic. And um, you think of bleach is 11, uh, and vinegar is more like three or four. Uh, seven is neutral, and that's what you want to keep is seven. Um, you know, your saliva is about seven, you know, your, your best water is about seven, un unless you want alkaline water, and that's when, you know, you see in the stores they're selling alkaline water. Uh, but you want to keep things as neutral as you can. So that's why you don't necessarily need the buffered tissue. We have a patron and I, and I feel I feel for this person. They have a lot of items they've inherited of various materials, paper, textile, and they and they know that they really need to be stored in the house in a climate controlled area. But there's no room if they have to put them in an attic or a garage. Is there anything we can do to minimize uh, uh, the damage that they may encounter? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. If you don't have the space, again, I would invest in acid-free boxes. Um, I would try to, you know, keep them off the floor, keep them, try to keep some air circulating around them. Um, it's very difficult because if you don't have the space and uh, sometimes putting them in a storage unit is not the best solution either because you don't know what else somebody has. There could be roaches or some other pests or coming from somebody else's unit into another unit. Uh, you know, a lot of different smells. Some of them aren't uh, climate controlled. Um, I always tell people that if you can keep the textiles in a area where you're comfortable, they'll be comfortable. Um, an attic or basement, basements are easier to sort of regulate than attics are. Attics get extremely hot. Um, and of course, basements can flood. Um, but I would definitely, you know, keep them in an area where it's off the floor, it has air circulating around it, uh, keep a sheet over top of it, or better, keep a, a piece of Tyvek over top of it. Tyvek actually sheds water. Um, it, it's not waterproof, but it will help shed it. We use them in museums, uh, in areas that we think might have, you know, water damage. So, um, it will keep things off of it. It will keep dust off the boxes and dirt off the boxes. Um, but it, you know, just sort of use a tent like uh, sheet over the, the box because that way it will help the air circulate around it. But it will, if something would happen with rain or any other kind of water, uh, it would help shed it. Well, when I was uh, growing up, if there was something special we wanted to say, my mother sent it to the dry cleaner. Oh. And they might put it in a box for us, wedding dresses, they often do that. I'm sure those weren't acid free. We can replace those. We can buy acid free boxes, but there's some chemicals in those dry cleaning compounds. Uh, is it safe to leave those in the fabrics? <laughs> um, well, we don't use as volatile chemicals as we used to. Um, it used to be that we used perchloroethylene, perk. Uh, that was the common chemical when your stuff came back from the dry cleaners, you take the bag off, it has that chemical smell. That was perk. Um, before that, it was carbon tetrachloride uh, back in the 60s and before, before that was regulated. Uh, nowadays, they're using green earth solvents and other types of solvents that are silicon based. Um, they don't get things as clean, um, I don't think, but there's still a lot of uh, research to be done out there about these newer chemicals that we're using. PERP was very good. 
Um, we use another chemical called Stoddard solvent. Um, uh, Stoddard's is also a very common chemical. It's still used in dry cleaning. Um, but there's a lot to be, you know, still worked at with these new chemicals. I would say that they're generally safe. Uh, they don't have that smell that they used to. I don't think they clean as well, but the silicone is, is probably a little better. Uh, PERC can actually be very harmful to textiles. It will, leak, it, some textiles it will burn. Um, but uh, again, you know, continue to dry clean your modern stuff. Uh, some dry cleaners will not even take antique textiles. They will walk away from it. Uh, there are places that you can uh, get wedding dress preservation done. Um, they are becoming fewer and far between. Uh, you have like 1940s, 50s, and 60s. You have acetate dresses usually. Um, uh, 60s and 70s, you have acetate, and then you have more you know, polyesters and things like that. Uh, the 1980s, the problem you have is with the beads melting uh, in the 80s and 90s. And then on today, you've got all of these different materials. So um, probably the dry cleaning chemicals, the, the silicone ones are as safe as they can be. I'm gonna ask two last questions and I, and I apologize if I didn't get to answer or ask everyone's question. They just started coming in. They're such good ones. Um, it's okay, well, I'm used to a lot of questions. <laughs> right. We have another patron who has a problem I've encountered, which is silverfish. Oh. And once they've got them, how do they get rid of them? Um, it's, it's all about preventative care. Um, there are traps and things that you can buy for silverfish. Silverfish like cellulose, so they tend to go more towards books than they do anything else, but they will eat cotton, they will eat rayon. If they're hungry, they'll, eat, they'll, they'll graze on any of that. So again, it's all preventive conservation, vacuuming your textile, keeping it in an acid-free box or sheet, or um, you know, just monitoring the environment is the best thing and, and investigating uh, different ways of, um, you know, you can put traps and things out to kill silverfish. And the last question I have, it's more just a, a reference for you. You've given us some great resources to go to. They're going to be on the handouts, most of your the resources, which you'll be getting, I promise. Um, but we had a few questions that I didn't bring up because they were very specialized about hats, fans, other accessories yes. for people who have these needs. We really didn't have time to go into that today. Are yeah. there places they could go, reputable places or sites that you could recommend they check out? Um, I would definitely, if you have materials like that, definitely consult on the AIC website, um, www.culturalheritage.org. Um, that's AIC to consult with a conservator because hats can have feathers on them. They can have straw in them. They can have lots of different components. And you need a conservator who specialized, especially with feathers, uh, the little ferals uh, break in hats and you need specific people to who know the right adhesives or the right methods of, of you know stabilizing that uh, in conjunction with the wool hat that it might be on. Um, so I would definitely consult uh, with AIC with something like that. Fans are another thing because you have either silk fans, paper fans, they have uh, wood staves on them. They can have ivory staves or bone or something like that. And then with materials like ivory, you have to be very careful with it um, because there are laws. Uh, if you wanted to have it conserved to sell, then you need to consult you know, with someone who knows about the laws, whether you can sell it or not, because I think it has to be more than a hundred years old, a certified antique. Uh, but then you're getting into from an endangered, animal. right? It's an endangered resource right. from an endangered yeah. animal, right? But definitely consult. A, uh, that's when you want to actually defer to the professionals with something like that. I'm going to give a plug for another program. Um, we have coming up later this month, a program with a local milliner, someone here in Wake County, and she may have some information. I, I don't know, but she might have some tips or suggestions. She is, is um has a background and is going to talk a little bit about the history of, of millinery hat making and even the process of blocking, just so you understand some of the pieces that go, how you make a hat and how it, how it fits the shape. And she'll show some of her pieces. She is a, a contemporary milliner working here in Wake County, but she may have some good tips on places to go about historic preservation for hats and some of their special needs. So that might be a good question to ask her uh, during her program. So well, Paige, I, I want to thank you for taking the time. We've been about almost an hour and a half this morning. I okay. see you're in the lab. I hope everyone realizes this is not your living room. This is the lab. No. <laughs> came into work just for this program. 
Uh, and I think you can see behind her what a specialized place it is. She's, you're only seeing a bit of the lab. So I love to go down. And my I, magnifying glass. Yeah, yes, that is my magnifying glass. <laughs> People ask me, how do you work on this stuff? And we use very, very tiny needles. We use very tiny threads. And being that I've been doing this more than 25 years, uh, I cannot sew without the magnifying glass now. <laughs> Uh, I love to come down as long as I'm not pestering them, which is hard to do because they're always so busy, but to, to pop into our, our conservation labs with either our um, artifact conservator or a textile page just to see what they're working on because every time I do, I learn something new. So, and I have today, and I've heard you give this program before, Paige, and I still learn something new. So thank you so much for sharing your wealth of information with us. Um, we talked before the program started that if we can help the museum, when I say we, help the public preserve their textiles, we're helping to preserve North Carolina history and American history. Whether those pieces ever come into a collection, um, those of you at home taking care of those heirlooms, those treasures, I call them, thank you. Um, because you, uh, it's people like you that help us keep our collection intact and we keep learning from it. And sometimes we borrow from you and do some beautiful exhibits. So thank you all for being with us this day. And um, Keep looking for those emails. They'll come within the next week, I promise. Uh, thank you so much and have a great weekend, thank everyone. You. Stay safe with the snow. I hope it doesn't yes. come. <laughs> All righty. Bye-bye.